All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And uh, so today we're going to do our unknown slide session. Um, again, if you would like to um, enter something into the Zoom group chat, if you want to put down your diagnosis, you're welcome to do that. I want to remind you guys, go on to uh, this uh, Durham Path on Demand website and subscribe. If you've subscribed to this, <clears throat> what happens is you get a, a notification of when these are posted. So uh, for those of you who are not watching right now uh, and, you're gonna, and you're watching it later, if you want to get a notification of that, uh, go ahead and subscribe to the site and then you know, you'll have access to these uh, kind of on notice. Okay, so today, unknowns. So I'm not just going to tell you the answer. I'm going to kind of describe it initially and then you can think about it. Hopefully, oh, sorry about that. You may have had a chance to look at these previously, but if not, you have a punch biopsy, inflammatory or neoplastic process. Well, it's got some kind of very busy dermis. Some people use that phrase. I'm not the world's biggest fan of that phrase, but you see something is going on down here in the dermis. That's, that's obviously, if it's inflammatory, it's really a dense, diffuse thing. And you can see they punched into the middle of it. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of the neoplasm or whatever it is goes to the side of the base. So, and you can see low power, these aren't all lymphocytes, there's some pallor to them. And as you get to progressively higher magnification, you can see that these are actually fibroblasts, blood vessels, and histiocytes here. Notice the stellate nature of these cells, some of them are really multinucleated. And so it's a fibrohistiocytic process. It is inflammatory in a way, it's not really an inflammatory um, process like say, uh, you know, contact dermatitis or something like that. But this is a in inflammatory condition. The cells are inflammatory. They're fibroblasts, lymphocytes, histiocytes, all those things. So it's, an, it's a reaction, if you will. And also notice the overlying epidermis. It's hyperplastic. It's, there's hyperpigmentation here. Um, if we look at the periphery of this, you can also see this other finding here that's characteristic of these large, thick keloidal collagen bundles. So I don't know if anybody knows the answer. You want to post it, you're welcome to do that. Yeah, someone's got a good, good, correct answer, which is a cellular dermatofibroma. And that's exactly what this is. There's several different var varieties of, of dermatofibroma. Um, this clinical photograph, these would actually be maybe what a cellular DF would look like. There's a so-called ankle type of dermatofibroma, where you even get more cellularity than that. Uh, you can get a lot of um, uh, foamy histiocytes in that lesion. And there's another histologic variant known as a dermatofibroma with monster cells. So it's get really large and atypical. Some people even talk about uh, the possibility of uh, dermatofibromas having aggressive biological behavior. They're very rare to do that, but there's a few cases that Fletcher and his group reported that actually spread to the lesions. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, so Drew's asking a question. You can't see the base for honeycomb. Well, honeycombing is really not the main finding. You can see that if you see a DFSP, but you don't get the type of cells that you see in the surface of this lesion in a DFSP virtually ever. Those are delicate spindle-shaped cells with uh, more of a mixoid stroma. Here we had this more fibroblastic stroma with inflammation and a lot of blood vessels. So that you don't really need the honeycomb to rule out a DFSP. Uh, in a situation like that. Now you can get dermatofibroma like changes overlying other lesions, but uh, that's relatively uncommon. So anyway, this was a good example of a cellular dermatofibroma. And uh, again, rare case of metastases reported extremely rare. There's like maybe 10 in the world. So it's really basically a benign process. Um, and if you were to do a stain on this, you could do a factor 13A positive. Uh, I don't really find that DFSP and everybody puts in the differential. It's really not the most common uh, differential diagnostic feature of DFSP. It's really more of a neural lesion most of the time. Uh, this lesion really, if it's going to look like anything else, uh, sometimes it might, you might see it with looking like a uh, atypical fibrozanthoma or something like that, but it's not really very commonly confused with dermatofiber sarcoma protuberans. Okay, the second of these lesions, and sometimes these take a while to load for some reason, that's an issue that we probably should address, <laughs> why it takes five minutes to load these up. I'm going to skip to the next one and see if it loads faster. And it does, and we'll come back to that one. So here we've got a uh, superficial, well, kind of an incisional biopsy, okay? And it's got a clear area in the middle of it. So 
the higher magnification. So you say, well, why is that clear? Well, it's got, there, there may be something inside that. That's one thing we kind of look at to, to sort of determine whether that's an artifact or not. And there is some kind of material in there, probably some kind of maybe uh, serum or something like that, but it's not purely artifacts. So whenever you get a, a space that's in here, it's got something in it, you know it's not fake. <clears throat> so that's a way that you can tell. So we say, well, if it's, it looks like it might be a cyst. So when it is a cyst, and you say, what's the difference between something is cyst and cystic? If it's cystic, it's not really a true cyst that's lined with an epithelial lining or lined with some kind of a lining to it. Uh, so we name cyst by looking at if there is a lining to the, to the cyst. What is the lining? So we're going to take a look here and see what the lining is of this, this cyst. And it is an epithelial lined cyst. And it's got these little small delicate projections that come from the surface of the cyst. It's also got these cells that have this grayish blue material in their cytoplasm in the wall of the cyst. So those are goblet cells or cells that are making mucin. So we got this, this thin lining. It's got these cuboidal cells at the bottom. It's got these little uh, projections into the surface. So yes, so we got another example here of a, uh, of a bronchogenic cyst, a cyst that is lined by uh, epithelium that's got cilia on the surface of it. And all this material inside the cyst is mucin. And uh, here you've got some lymphocytes in the wall of the cyst. Sometimes you'll see like in a branchial cleft cyst and some of those you may get actually some uh, lymphocytes and those actually can be related to the thymus gland in some cases. We see dermal thymus on occasion, but this is an example of a bronchogenic cyst. And sometimes you'll even see some cartilage. Um, this is kind of recapitulating the epithelium of the, uh, the tracheal bronchial tree cilia, if you will, a nice example of that over here. So these are not apocrine cells. These are little cilia that you see on the surface here. So a nice example of that. And clinically, these usually occur in a midline location like this. So you should go back and review your uh, embryology with regard to things that occur in the midline of children. Uh, and sometimes even they present later in life, but uh, thyroglossal duct cyst, usually that kind of exits somewhere up in this area. The branchial cleft cyst and branchial uh, analoga, they usually occur kind of to the side, but uh, this was a bronchogenic cyst. And uh, you, one thing about these, sometimes you have to be concerned that they don't communicate with the trachea. So if you go in and, and just start cutting in a midline area, you have to be careful that you don't get into something that's, that's deep that you don't get into. So you know, dermatologists getting into the uh, tracheal bronchial tree, probably not the world's best situation. So again, if you do want to remove those that can be surgically sized, uh, rarely, rarely they can become malignant as time goes on. So somebody, uh, that's one reason why a lot of people recommend that they are excised. I'm gonna go back to number two and see if it's had a chance to load. So sometimes these things just take a long time. I guess maybe that's scanned in with a lot more information, but so we are going back to the second one here. So you get a punch biopsy this time and at low power, it really doesn't show very much uh, inflammation. It's interesting because it's got two things going on here. It's got an artifactual, uh, well, a secondary finding that, that's unrelated. But if you look at low power, you can see that it's got a really uh, pretty thick dermis going all the way down to the subcutaneous fat here. There's really no subcutaneous fat at the bottom of this. This is just some ink. And then it's got this really sclerotic squared off appearance. So you see that at low magnification, obviously you should think of the possibility of uh, one of the sclerosing disorders and you all know what the pathologic features of sclerosis are it's homogenization and thickening of the collagen bones with a decrease in the number of fibroblasts and if you look in this field right here there's no fibroblasts Maybe a few over here but none right in this area so this is sclerotic so this is a sclerosing process and i'm sure you guys know what the diagnosis is you have morphia and what is interesting about this case is it had coincidental um vascular area, maybe a little coincidental hemangioma. Now, what form of morphia or scleroderma gives you vascular components also to it? Everybody should know the answer to that. I don't see anybody jumping in on the chat line, but obviously if you had somebody with these multiple mat-like telangiectasia, had scleroderma-like change in their skin, you biopsy and show features that look like morphia, but they also have these mat-like telangiectasia in their face, you would think of, of crest. So in this case, I think this is just a coincidental hemangioma. They just happen to get it. 
the patient, this was submitted to us as Rulap, scleroderma, Rulap morphia, and they just happened to have a little uh, hemangioma and they got biopsy. So that really was unrelated. So you all know what uh, morphia looks like clinically. And uh, fortunately, the clinical photograph is, is coming up pretty slow also. These are the, the uh, basically um, histologic uh, clinical features, the, the pink lilac lesions that occur early, and then later on they get white and thick and sclerotic. So uh, there we go, finally got the clinical photograph to come up. And uh, so this early kind of lilac color at the periphery is, is, is really very nice when you see that with morphia. Here's kind of a later lesion that's kind of got some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So late lesions of morphia look brown. Uh, early lesions can kind of look pinkish or, or kind of heliotrope-like, if you will, a lilac color, and then they can also get white. And sometimes when you biopsy a white lesion of morphia, it's got morphia at the bottom in the dermis and lichen sclerosis at the top. So we not uncommonly see combinations of morphia with features of LSNA in a biopsy. So anyway, if you look at the other sort of family of, of entities that can give you sclerosing uh, changes in the dermis, you really can't tell morphia from scleroderma or can't really tell it from any of the other forms of, of those conditions. Uh, chronic uh, sclerosing scleroderma form PCT, uh, you can get a scleroderma form uh, dermatomyositis. So a sclerodermatomyositis can give, give an overlap between morphia or, or scleroderma and dermatomyositis. Those can look pretty, they all look pretty similar. They all have that sclerotic collagen. Uh, if you look at people that took the toxic oil uh, a few years ago and, and got the, uh, the scleroderma form changes there too. They all look pretty similar. So again, you have to have clinical correlation to really uh, diagnose these, these variants of uh, sclerosing processes. Okay, we're going to skip over to case number four now. So back in order and uh, take a look at this one over here. So uh, low magnification. A superficial perivascular infiltrate with little lymphocytes here. And the main change in the epidermis here, notice you've got a marked storiatus form hyperplasia of the epidermis, and it's pretty regular over a pretty broad front. And you've got some parakeratosis you can see at low power. So obviously, what's the number one thing you think of when you see a storiatus form dermatitis? You think of psoriasis. Hopefully everybody thought that. Good. And uh, this is pretty classic for psoriasis, dilated tortuous blood vessels, thin superpapillary plates, loss of the granular cell layer, mounds of parakeratosis with neutrophils. So those of you that tuned in to the lecture on psoriasis and dermatitis a couple of weeks ago, um, you'll recognize this. It shows every feature of psoriasis here. So um, by now, hopefully this was pretty straightforward. So items in the differential diagnosis, um, psoriasis or drug eruption maybe, but uh, you know, basically, this is pretty prototypical for psoriasis. Usually, a psoriasis and drug eruption doesn't give you quite this amount of psoriasis and hyperplasia. Uh, you always have to think about fungal infections, so PAS stain. But in a case like this, it's just so classic. Uh, I'm not even sure we would even bother doing a PAS stain on this. So uh, this one's pretty beautiful. No, no real problem here for the diagnosis. Um, the gets more difficult when you get a, a spongiotic psoriasis dermatitis or a psoriasis with a lot of spongiosis, or you're trying to differentiate between sebderm and psoriasis. If this were on the scalp, you do have some mounds of perichoritosis at the edge of the follicular ostea here. So uh, if we just had this field right here, you might think of psoriasis, or you might even think about um, possibility of SIBO psoriasis. We're not sure we see combinations of both. Um, basically, we sometimes call it that. Drew's asking the question, AIDS-associated psoriasis. Um, no, I, the ones that I've seen, I've seen all forms. I've seen it look like pustular, like Reiter's disease. I've seen it look like classic psoriasis. So I, I don't think you can really tell it apart uh, under the microscope. The one thing about HIV positive inflammatory diseases, they sometimes get more plasma cells. So uh, if you see that, that's like a clue, but uh, it can, they can have just classic garden variety psoriasis also. So these are some pretty good examples of that. So if you get really, it depends on the stage of psoriasis. We've talked about that in the, in the lecture the other day too, but if you get really an early guttate psoriasis, you won't see this degree of psoriasis from hyperplasia. It's just kind of a blunted psoriasis from hyperplasia, just these little fine wafer-like scales 
on the surface with mounds of perikeratosis and focal loss of the granular cell layer. So you don't really get the classic florid psoriasis hyperplasia when you're dealing with an early eruptive form like gutte psoriasis. So uh, just items in the differential diagnosis, PRP, we see that on occasion also, usually again, doesn't give you this, this degree to psoriasis microplasia, gives you a different cornified layer change uh, than we saw here. Okay, so let's take a look at this over here and we're gonna turn this upside down because it really should look more like this. So we've got a uh, shave biopsy now of a neoplastic process, okay. And uh, I don't know, maybe it actually was kind of oriented a little bit like that, but we're going to turn it like this because this is kind of the, the shape that we want you to kind of get the idea here. So it's a epithelial neoplasm. And if you look at it, you draw a line right down the middle. You can kind of fold this side over on this side. It's very small. This whole thing's maybe about a three or four millimeter punch. And uh, so it's got all the features of a benign lesion, small, symmetrical, well circumscribed, low magnification. Go to higher magnification, and it's epithelial. And now, what do we see here? We've got some cells that are falling apart from one another. We've got some cells that are hyperchromatic. We've got some of these little round structures here. They look like, if you speak French, round bodies, corons, and then we've got these little grain-like structures, these acantholytic, dyskeratotic, parakeratotic nuclei up here. So we've got focal acantholytic dyskeratosis as a reaction pattern. We've also talked about this uh, not too long ago. And we look down here, we don't really see any, we've got a mitotic figure here or there, but we don't really see any atypical cells. Whole thing overall looks benign. So I don't know if anybody wants to chime in what they think the answer is. Good, warty dyskeratoma, that's exactly what this is. So hopefully you'll remember the uh, various disorders that give you acantholytic dyskeratosis, and warty dyskeratoma is one of those. If this was a widespread eruption of small papules and had this change here, you would maybe think about the possibility of Grover's disease or also uh, dairy age disease. That, you know, those are relatively small lesions. We're not going to give you this large inverted cup-shaped uh, neoplasm like you see with warty dyskeratoma. And I mean, let's just show the other piece because uh, here we've just got a, maybe this might be the surface of it, but on the other hand, it could be uh, something seen to the side of it or whatever. So if you just get a little shave biopsy of a warty dyskeratoma, um, you know, go back, yeah. This is what you might see, just something like this. It's really, really subtle. So if you just had this, you might think about Grover's disease or something like that. So you really, this kind of shows you why if you're going to take a shave biopsy one of these things, you really got to make sure you get deep enough to where you can actually see this part of it over here. You know, this, this is where the diagnosis is. It's really not here. You can suspect it from there because it shows the FAD, but you know, you're not going to be able to call this a definitive warty dyskeratoma just on this biopsy. You might be able to call it like possible surface warty dyskeratoma, something like that, and comment on the acanthalytic dyskeratosis. So uh, anyway, that you have to really get a deeper biopsy. And here's an example of what one of these lesions might have looked like clinically. These are usually on the head and neck area. They're on the scalp uh, or the, the temple area. Are, and they often get submitted to us as rule out basal cell or squamous cell and uh, they're not. So you just make sure you know the, the entities which can give you the uh, focal acanthotic dyskeratosis histology. Okay, so these are just some of the other items in the different diagnosis to, to think about here. So, uh, Probably the one that gets confused the most commonly is acantholytic squamous cell. Uh, again, that doesn't give you classic acantholytic dyskeratosis like we saw here. You can get some acantholytic cells, but the acantholytic cells are always atypical. And they're acantholytic because they're neoplastic and they lose the desmosomes and they break apart from one another. So here they've lost their desmosomes because of the acantholytic dyskeratotic process. It's really kind of a different ball game. Okay. Look at this lesion here. Okay, this is uh, a shave biopsy. And uh, it's, you know, we get better biopsies of this, but it does show the, the pathognomonic changes here, if you will. So we've got a shave. It may have been submitted as a rule out squamous cell, rule out wart, something along those lines. 
And I want to call your attention. So first, first of all, there's really, it's a shave. So they were thinking the neoplasm here. Shows minimal inflammation in the dermis. Shows a little bit of maybe of some slight thickening of the dermal collagen bundles. But it shows this markedly thickened cornified layer. Okay, this looks like it's taken from volar skin. But it's not volar skin because there's a hair follicle over here. So when you're kind of logically putting things together, when you've got a hair follicle plus skin that looks like it's from volar skin, what's the diagnosis? What's, what's going on here? What's the pathologic process that's happening when you get that situation? Yeah, it's lichen simplex chronicus or paragonodularis. And uh, notice here that you've got a markedly thickened uh, granular cell layer. And one other thing about prognodularis is very common or lichen simplex chronic is the skin also kind of gets thrown into folds like this. You get this papillomatosis. So um, it kind of looks like a wart, but it's not. It's really mainly this, this, uh, this papillomatosis that occurs as a reaction pattern when you rub your skin. So basically, this is a nice example of just lichen simplex chronicus, or it's not really as good for prognodularis because that usually gives you more psoriasis or hyperplasia, irregular and verrucous features. So this is mainly just lichen simplex with this verrucous epithelial hyperplasia a little bit here. Um, uh, yeah, Gene is putting in there about the fact that you get the blood vessels. And yeah, you do usually get some dilated, tortuous blood vessels, even more than we see here. But uh, that's pretty common for lichen simplex chronicus also. And as opposed to psoriasis, where you get thinning of the suprapapillary plates, here you actually get thickening of the suprapapillary plates. So anyway, that's just a nice example uh, of, uh, and you see these, these are the blood vessels beneath down in the dermis. You can notice how they're kind of being oriented in a vertical fashion. They're kind of being, they're going this way instead of this way like they normally do. So a nice example of uh, lichen simplex, prior nodularis. Uh, probably wouldn't have looked as much like these lesions, maybe more like these lesions over here, this specific biopsy. And uh, just remember the various clinical features of these. Um, these generally tend to be located in places where it's kind of harder to reach. So that's kind of important to remember as well. Um, and then you look out of the microscope, it pretty much shows everything that we, we saw here. So the main thing is when you get, really get a lot of pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, they can really look a lot like a uh, squamous cell carcinoma sometimes. So you have to make sure that you don't overcall that. Uh, and keratoacanthoma is on the lower legs of, of usually older individuals. They often get prognodularis there. They'll rub the areas and they can kind of simulate, uh, there, there can be some overlap between keratoacanthoma and, and uh, prognodularis. Okay, so here we've got a, another, looks like probably an, an excisional biopsy. So uh, again, here's the normal overlying epidermis, the dermis, and then this process is situated quite deep in the skin here. So we're dealing with something that is, is down in the lower part of the dermis, maybe the upper subcutaneous fat here. So you can imagine that clinically, they probably thought this was a cyst. So just about any kind of dermal nodule that a dermatologist sees, they submit those as cysts. And, uh, so beware of the diagnosis of cysts. A lot of things can look like a cyst, but they aren't cysts. Metastatic lesions, um, I've seen now probably five or six examples of desoplastic wound melanoma that were submitted as cysts. So lots of things can look like a cyst, but they're not in dermatology. So we look at this and say, well, it's a neoplasm of some sort. Um, even though it's deep, it seems to be fairly well circumscribed, seems to be pretty symmetrical. And sometimes when something is multi-nodular in a cystic in a nodular lesion like this, look at the individual nodular aggregations and ask yourself, well, what about this individual aggregation? Is this small, well circumscribed and symmetrical? You know, if you get like a, uh, say, multi nodular sarcoma, where you get like multiple aggregations, but if you look at individual aggregations in those lesions, they're asymmetrical. They're not well circumscribed. So the individual little components that make up the larger neoplasm are also show signs of malignancy, even architecturally. So here we're looking at this, and you can see the individual aggregations themselves are small, symmetrical, well circumscribed, and then you have multiple of these aggregations that make up the, the larger entity. And so let's go to higher magnification and say, well, is this epithelial or non-epithelial? It's non-epithelial. It's got these you know, spindle-shaped cells here, and some of them have this kind of you know, uh, delicate, smooth, uh, wavy, lazy, S-shaped morphology to them. Others a little bit more epithelioid. And then we're looking at this area over here. 
we've got these beautiful examples of where we've got these individual cells lining up across from one another. So uh, yeah, varicae bodies, close spelling there. But uh, they think, of, think of this as the Greeks and the Trojans over here getting ready to have a war. You got all the guys on the horseback over here getting ready to just charge across the field and they're gonna attack one another. So that's a varicae body. And varicae rhymes with A, so it's Antony A type of schwannoma or neurolemoma where you get varicae bodies like this. Now it's not uncommon to see other areas where you don't have a lot of varicae bodies, still some right over here, but you can get the Antony B type where you don't have the varicae bodies, you just get this kind of fibromucinous stroma associated with the individual cells. So you get a lot of mucin in the Antony B type, varicae in the Antony A type. So yes, this is a schwannoma or a neurolemoma. And one feature of schwannoma as opposed to a neurofibroma is that you may see, and you very commonly do see, the pre-existing nerve where the lesion arises from in a schwannoma. In a neurofibroma, you sort of think of the way those form is that, uh, well, just kind of imagine you're like a little microscopic man or woman and you're walking inside of a nerve and uh, you have a hand grenade or bomb with you and you set it off and it blows everything up. Well, that's how a neurofibroma forms, kind of forms from within the nerve uh, twig and you get lots of Schwann cells and you don't really have too many axons left. A Schwannoma, on the other hand, uh, develops on the side, on the edge of the pre-existing nerve. So you can think of this as almost like if this were a, a twig of a tree where you had a, the a Schwannoma kind of popped up on the side of it, if you will, and you can usually see the residual nerve twig left there. So that's one way to kind of help uh, your mind at least think about how these things kind of form. So this is an Antony A schwannoma with varicae bodies. And these are what these things look like. You know, they're basically just kind of subcutaneous uh, papules or nodules. They, they know, and clinicians usually don't think about them. These are not usually painful. So the neuromas are painful. The schwannomas, non-painful. Neurofibromas, non-painful. So these are not in your differential diagnosis of the of the painful bingle, angle, whatever your mnemonic device is here. So other things to think about are, are some of the uh, other spindle cell neoplasms, lyomyomas, uh, maybe melanocytic, and then other neural lesions to think about. So neuromas, uh, not the delicate smooth muscle, the, the, the delicate uh, fibromucinous stroma so much in those lesions. Those are often more fibrotic if they're in Morton's neuroma or you'll get more cellularity. You don't get the, the uh, varicate bodies. Okay, let's take a look at this lesion here and uh, shift around here. Let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so we've got a punch biopsy and it's solid blue. Whenever you think of blue, you usually think of bad. So we see blue in a skin biopsy in dermatopathology, that's not a good thing. Usually it's it means that there's something that's neoplastic here. If it's dark blue, you can think about maybe lymphocytes, right? So if they look black at low magnification, so gosh, you know, these are pretty dark, maybe black, maybe you think it's possibly some kind of lymphoid process. So if it's lymphoid cells, and there's just many of them, and it's diffuse, and there's no wedge shape to it, so it's not top heavy, this is equally bottom heavy as top heavy, so it's, everything is, is going on here. So hopefully at mag low magnification, you might say, gosh, this might even be a malignant lymphoma. But you should think about other things that can give you dark staining cells that are diffuse. So you can't, you know, if you look at this, say, well, can we assess breath symmetry circumscription? No, because if somebody's punched into a large lesion, so we can't do that. But we can say is that it's diffuse. There's no tendency to a wedge shape, which favors benign. Here we've got this thing is diffuse all the way through, side to side, top to bottom. That's another sign of malignancy. There's no maturation. So we have to use ancillary features. And then as we go to higher magnification, um, you can see that these cells look very much like lymphocytes. So they're small, they're black, they're dark, they're comprised almost wholly of, of chromatin here. Um, and, and these are not smudgy nuclei. You can pretty much draw a nice little uh, line around each one of them. So obviously if you're thinking something like a neuroendocrine carcinoma, which also can give you a dense diffuse blue infiltrate, um, this would favor a lymphoid process. 
And uh, so if we say, well, you know, if it's possibly a lymphoma, given that it's diffuse and doesn't have dermal centers, ask yourself, is it more likely a T or a B cell lymphoma? Uh, the, the T cell lymphoma is like the epidermis. Uh, the B cell lymphoma, you'll often get a little grin zone. So this one's kind of got a little mixed pattern. It's got some involvement in the epidermis here. So I would probably think this would maybe be more likely a T cell lymphoma, given that you've got some epidermotropus in here and you don't really have a nice grin zone in this case. So uh, it's a lymphoma. Uh, in a case like this, we would probably want to work this up. Uh, it's a very, very dense diffuse lymphoma. And, and in this pattern, it's even possibly this could be tumor stage mycosis fungoides. So basically, in this case, the diagnosis, which you wouldn't really know for sure, was basically just an, an anaplastic large cell lymphoma. You see a lot of these cells are large or atypical. Um, this is the kind of lesion that uh, we would work this up and see if it's a T mostly or a B cell lesion mostly. And we'd probably do some other stains like CD30. If it's an anaplastic large cell lymphoma, those are the ones that usually are T cell positive and they're also are CD30 positive and can be ALK1 positive if they're not really generated in the skin initially. They don't have to be, but uh, if the ALK1 is positive, that tends to favor one that might have spread to the skin rather than starting out in the skin. But this could also be a tumor stage of mycosis fungoides that might have a CD30 positive uh, transformation, large cell transformation. So again, you need clinical correlation to diagnose those. So if a patient came in like this and they just had solitary lesion, you know, or one or two lesions, you would not really favor that as being mycosis fungoides. But if they had widespread patches of plaques and had this type of lesion that looked like a tumor, then you could say, well, it, you know, very well could be tumor stage MF with large cell transformation. So you just have to remember that and put it into, uh, into the, you know, use clinical correlation to make a diagnosis. Uh, some of these do very well, surprisingly, even though they're very atypical and have a lot of funny atypical cells. If they're localized to the skin, they actually have a really good prognosis. If they spread from internal sites to the skin, that's not as good of a prognosis. So you have to make sure that you work the patient up appropriately and that you don't miss a nodal lesion that's CD30 positive that can spread to the skin and can have a much worse prognosis. Okay, go over the next case, number nine. Okay, this one's kind of finicky. I'll give it a second. So I got a Ferris wheel. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So low power, we've got a punch biopsy, inflammatory or neoplastic process. Looks like an inflammatory process, superficial perivascular dermatitis. And we ask ourselves, well, what part of the body are we on? Well, you should be able to kind of come up with some idea. Yeah, good. Somebody said mucous membrane, which is good. That's exactly what this is. Notice that the epidermis does not have a granular cell layer really not even epidermis, it's epithelium. It doesn't even really have a cornified layer. So it's on the mucous membrane area, which is it's good that you pick that up. So inflammatory, superficial, perivascular, band-like, and it actually obscures the dermatological structure. So it's lichenoid, lichenoid inflammatory process. So we think of lichenoid on the mucous membrane, and we go to higher magnification yet again here, all lymphocytes, the vast majority of the cells are lymphocytes. Some of them might be some plasma cells because anytime you get any biopsy on mucous membrane surface, you can get some plasma cells there. So we always think of syphilis when we see plasma cells, but if you're on a mucous membrane site, it's not uncommon to get other diseases where you get plasma cells. So it doesn't always mean syphilis. If it is syphilis, 99% of the time, there are at least some plasma cells in there. They don't have to be, but they almost always are. But you don't always have to think of syphilis, or at least it's not always likely to be syphilis when there's plasma cells in the mucous membrane site. So hopefully you guys have had some ideas here of what the diagnosis is. So when you get lichenoid stomatitis, what's the most common cause of that? Good, mucosal lichen planus, which is correct. And that's what this is in this case. So this is lichen planus on the mucous membrane. And this is what it looks like. Um, you don't get the sawtooth epidermal reedy to the same degree that you get on, on glabrous skin. It usually just kind of looks like this. It's just a dense lichen infiltrate that obscures the epithelium um, and, the, and the, the junction of the epithelium and the lamina propria here. 
and then you can get a little, sometimes you get a little wet shaped hypergranulosis. So, but it's basically very similar and analogous to like in plasma and non mucous membrane site. Now, one thing that happens a lot in oral mucous membrane lesions is that there's erosion. And over here, you may actually have a little bit of that. So this may have been erosive LP over here uh, in a setting where there's just the good, pretty classic, obvious like in Plattis in this situation. There's a couple other things to think about, especially if you're off of the, uh, if you're out of the oral mucous membrane area, if you're down in the genital area, so-called Zunes balanitis or plasma cell vulvitis. That to me is probably a variant of lichen planus. It's got a lot of plasma cells in it, but, uh, and it can look pretty similar. They just get this beefy red eroded area. You biopsy it and instead of having mostly lymphocytes, it's got mostly plasma cells, but it's, to me, it's probably the same disease. It just has more plasma cells. Here you see the nice Wickham stria. Beautiful example of that. And uh, so obvious, some clinical information. Hopefully you all know all this uh, pretty straightforward clinical information about oral lichen planus. The one thing you got to be careful about um, is that it can be associated with, uh, can develop into cancer. So people that have long-term lichen planus, beware of them developing into squamous cell carcinoma. And Drew's asking about mucosal uh, LE. Um, you're right, that is pretty doggone rare. If you're going to see that, you're going to see more vacuolar alterations. Sometimes you can get an overlap between lichen planus and lupus, and if they look like that together, you're not going to really be able to diagnose that unless there's obvious clinical features there, because they can look pretty similar if you get lichenoid LE, uh, but it's real rare to get that in the mucous membrane site. So I wouldn't worry as much about that if you're going to get that, and, and you probably, you might get lymphoid nodules, but I'm not sure you'd always would get that. So again, just remember other things that can give you this. Lichen planus pemphigoides, basically, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, perineoplastic pemphigus can also give you lichen infiltrate. So sometimes you can see that. That's really diagnosed mostly on the basis of uh, you get more eosinophils in that, and also you get the immunofluorescence findings. If you do immunofluorescence in lichen planus, you usually, if it's positive, it doesn't have to be, you get a thick, uh, granular deposit of fibrinogen at the dermatoidal junction with the cytoid bodies. So uh, that can help you there sometimes, but it's not the best way to make the diagnosis. It's really better to uh, just use the histology and, and clinical correlation. Okay, so we're going to look at this one next. Okay, this is a uh, punch biopsy once again. And this one may show more of it over here. Okay, good. We see a superficial perivascular infiltrate of something here. Hard to tell for sure. And a lot of extravasated erythrocytes. Some of these are going to be lymphocytes, but probably not all of them. So really not, you can just basically kind of get into the category of a superficial perivascular infiltrate of this power. And, and there's some extravasated erythrocytes. We're going to go to higher magnification to see if I can give us some more information. So as we go to higher magnification, see, yes, not all of these are lymphocytes. Some of them are. We also have neutrophils, and we've got breakdown products of neutrophils here. Okay, some of these project better than others. We've got a lot of extravasated red cells. Let's keep kind of going along here, and uh, we'll see if we see anything inside any of these blood vessels here. So maybe this blood vessel here has got some fibrin in it. It's not really great. Um, Let's see if I see one that's got even some better features. There's another blood vessel here that's got some neutrophils and some erythrocytes around it. So uh, the differential diagnosis at low power might be Schamberg's, but when you start seeing neutrophils and breakdown products of neutrophils, even if you don't see a lot of fiber in the blood vessel walls, hopefully you all have an idea of what the, the correct answer is here. This is like an evolving lesion of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Let's look at the other piece and see if it's got even more features of that. Yeah, so this is not one that's got well-defined fibrin in the blood vessels. So if you get an early lesion of LCV, it's got polys here, that helps you. You do not see polys in persistent pigmented purpuric dermatitis. So if that's the differential that you're getting, you have to look to see if there are neutrophils, breakdown product of neutrophils with the little extravasated erythrocytes that you can see here. You've got a lot of them, but a lot of this may be artifact. That helps you to distinguish an early lesion of LCD from one that is fully developed. 
fully developed ones, you'll, you'll get the obvious fibrin in the blood vessel walls, the thrombosis, the lumina. We really don't have a lot of that here. So this is an early lesion. So these blood vessels probably are being damaged here, but you just don't really see a lot of fibrin. So that's the key to the early diagnosis of LCD is the presence of the neutrophils and the breakdown products. You don't have to have um, the fully developed fibrin in the blood vessel wall. So this wouldn't be considered a fully developed lesion of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So it probably wouldn't look like this. It might look like maybe one of these lesions. You have a little teensy tiny petechia and you biopsy that, that might look like the histology that we're looking at today. If you biopsy one of these, you're going to see well-defined fibrin, thrombosis of the lumina, and, and the leukocytic clays and other features there. So just remember the criteria for early developed lesions when you're, when you're dealing with an early lesion. And that's a lot of times when we get the diagnosis. By the time it's pretty classic palpable purpura, a lot of clinicians don't even take a biopsy of it. I mean, they, they feel pretty sure that's what it is. Uh, but, you know, clinicians get worried about vasculitis, so they make sure they don't have lupus or some other connective tissue disease or something along those lines. So they'll, they'll take a biopsy of it usually. But if you get it early, when you talk about the differential between L LCV and persistent magnetic perverted dermatitis, you're probably going to get a very tiny lesion. And that's where you really want to see uh, the differential when you're looking for those types of cells in the infiltrate. Um, IgA, uh, vasculitis, if you do a biopsy for immunofluorescence, it's helpful if you get the biopsy generally within the first 24 hours or so after the, the eruption develops. If you biopsy it a week later, it's going to be negative. If you biopsy it too early, it may be negative. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be positive in LCV. We see classic LCV with negative immunofluorescence. So if you get a IgA, it's helpful, but if you don't get it, it doesn't mean it's not LCV. So just remember that also. And if you get lots of polys, it tends to favor uh, IgA-mediated vasculitis. Okay, let's move on to this. Okay, so we've got a shave biopsy here. And it's a shave. Okay, so it's a small lesion. It's well circumscribed. Draw a line right in the middle of it. Fold it over on itself. It looks pretty symmetrical, so it's, it's probably going to behave in a benign fashion. And it's got verrucous epithelial hyperplasia, it's got an exoendophytic morphology, and we look over here, we've even got, you know, some abscess formation inside a couple of these little areas here. We've got some neutrophils down here, we've kind of got some pink bulbous aggregates of keratinocytes, sometimes you're looking at kind of a glassy basal membrane surrounding some of these. And, uh, and a little bit of hyperkeratosis overlying it, but not a ton. So it may have been rubbed. So you know, if anybody knows what the diagnosis is here, yeah, it's a keratoacanthoma. And there are several different forms of keratoacanthomas. Um, today, they all get called squamous cell carcinoma, uh, keratoacanthoma type. We do that mainly because insurance has decided in their infinite wisdom that KAs or cosmetic lesions are not even neoplasms to them, so they don't even recognize the diagnosis anymore. So in order to make sure that dermatologists get paid for what they're doing and that it's an appropriate uh, evaluation of the patient, we basically are now, everybody's calling them squamous cell carcinoma, keratoacanthoma type. So, but I, I really think there's a difference between most KAs like this and most Crateriform squamous cells. This doesn't have as much cytologic atypia. Um, these lesions can, and we put a note in our reports that say these lesions may behave in a more benign fashion. They can be followed and treated conservatively sometimes. So just because you get back the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma K type doesn't mean you have to hop directly to Mohs. Um, they can sometimes be treated with intralesional methotrexate or 5-FU or DNC or radiation therapy or follow them sometimes. They just they, they go away on their own. So just know that the name has changed, but the biology of the lesion hasn't changed. And what if somebody's got the Ferguson Smith type or they got a thousand of these? Do you have to excise every one of those? No, you don't. In fact, you shouldn't. Those should be treated with something like maybe a systemic retinoid or something like that. So uh, it's, this is a, a nice example of a small KA and probably not, you know, maybe like one of these, a little smaller lesion. The K is going to occur due to trauma, they can chemnerize. And one of the reasons that you may not want to excise Ks all the time is sometimes they can chemnerize at the periphery of the margin. 
Uh, and in that situation, don't keep excising. Don't send it to Mo's. You know, they'll just get more and more of them. You want to maybe think about using a medical therapy so that they quit producing them. So uh, anyway, that was a caraway canthoma. We all felt well aware of ipilimumab inducing KAs. It causes the uh, shift to a different pathway and causes a proliferation of the keratinocytic RAF pathway. So uh, RAS blockagene pathways, so just make sure you understand how that works. Uh, boards are likely to ask that. And in this case, the guy developed multiple Ks within a tattoo in this one specific case here. So just remember the differential diagnosis of KAs. Probably the most important is make sure you don't overcall paragonodularis as a squamous cell. You can get other areas where you get pseudoepithelial hyperplasia, hyperplastic, hypertrophic like in plants, for example, that ought to be in the differential here, which it's not. So just remember that you can get things that look like KAs that, that are just reactive epithelial hyperplasia sometimes. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at this lesion here. It's a shave biopsy. And you can see once again that it's, uh, this in this case, it's a neoplasm again, and you can see it low power. It's got some nesting of cells here. So it's probably gonna be a melanocytic lesion. It's got higher magnification. Indeed, it is melanocytic. It's got nests of melanocytes, mostly at the dermal junction. It's got some epidermal recia that are elongated, and it's got some bridging of some of the nests. So uh, small, symmetrical, well circumscribed with these elongated reedy and the fibroplasia looks a lot like a dysplastic nevus, at low magnification. But let's go to higher magnification. And now you see the cells here that are above the junction. There's some cells in the granular and cornified layer. Some cells here that have some pycnotic nuclei and some other features here. So are we going to instantly change the diagnosis now to malignant melanoma? Hopefully not. I don't see anybody putting a bunch of things into the chat room yet. <laughs> so since before this lecture, you probably see MIS. Well, hopefully you'll never say that again. But notice you've got these sunburn cells here, sunburn keratinocytes, and you've got these melanocytes that are, are kind of degenerating and they're being transepidermally eliminated. So I don't know if anybody knows the diagnosis is here. This is what happens if you have a nevus and you go outside, get sunburn, and then you go see your dermatologist and they see it and they take a biopsy and they send it to you to us and it, and it looks like this. This is what a nevus with sunburn, ultraviolet light damage looks like. So it's got this transepidermal elimination of these uh, sunburned keratinocytes plus melanocytes, and it can simulate malignant melanoma. So this is not malignant melanoma, it's a simulator of it. So you have to use your other criteria. Use your small symmetrical well circumscribed features. Use the fact that uh, most of the cells are at the junction, and then you have to know what happens if you get a nevus that's sunburned, like in this, uh, this individual here who was basically abusing his skin. <laughs> so, uh, and he was young, so he didn't know any better yet, but uh, he's a future patient and uh, he's got this nevus that got sunburned. So just remember, if you biopsy a sunburned nevus, it can give you features that can simulate malignant melanoma. If you know the, the histologic criteria, you won't overcall it. How long does it take those features to go away? Generally about six weeks. So uh, if somebody comes in with a melanocytic lesion, they've had a sunburn, you want to make sure you don't get into a problem with your, you know, dermatopathologist raising all these kind of weird questions and scaring everybody. Um, wait. So wait six weeks to take a biopsy. But if you know what you're doing, it shouldn't really pose a differential problem. You shouldn't really ever call something like that a melanoma. Okay, we're going to look at this one. So this, if you want the technique of biopsy here, so there's no skin here, no skin. So remember we have shave, we have punch, we have excision and incisional biopsies. And then we have that other technique that we use pretty frequently that people don't tend to think about. Yeah, nucleation technique. So we don't know what part of the body you're on. We know that there's something going on down here pretty deep that someone decided they obviously thought it might be a cyst or something like that. So they probably put a nick on the surface of it and said, well, let's see if we can dissect this out. And it didn't dissect out very well. So we've got these proliferation of these cells here that are epithelioid. And they have uh, some hyperchromatic nuclei. And then a lot of them are multinucleated here with lots of nuclei 
inside them here. Like they're not really forming a Teuton giant cell or anything like that. This is just kind of a cluster. You have osteoclast like giant cells. So you've got these cells here that might be sort of in the fibrovisteocytic osteoblast like category. And you've got these osteoclast like giant cells. So this came from near um, volar skin, may have actually been on volar skin. We don't really know for sure because we don't have really any clues to tell us. But when you see these type of cells, these osteoclast like giant cells in a setting where there's really no cytologic atypia, maybe in some cases you'll see some fibroplasia within them. You might even see some osteoid formation that may be osteoid right here that's forming in this lesion. When you get osteoclast and osteoblast like cells, obviously form bone, yeah, giant cell tumor. So this is a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. And if you leave these lesions alone long enough, eventually most of these cells go away and you're left with just fibrous tissue. And sometimes you can get cartilage. I mean, maybe these are little early chondrocytes forming here. I and mean, this looks kind of like osteoid that's forming here. So we, we see that. If you leave them alone long enough, they become fibromas of tendon sheath. And that's in the family of the fibromatoses. We're talking about things like Dupuytren's contracture, uh, torticollis, uh, Peyronie's disease, all these various things. If you biopsy those and you get into, this, into the collagen there, into the fibrotic areas, desmoid fibromatosis is another one. Um, it will look like the fibromatous lesion, and this lesion is in the same family of that. So you should at least know something about the fibromatoses. You don't have to become a soft tissue pathologist, but you should know a little bit about that. And there are several of those that are associated with neurologic syndrome. So patients that have Turner syndrome can get torticollis and they can get desmoid tumors. People have Gardner syndrome. Uh, again, they can get uh, cysts, they can get desmoid fibromatoses, they get colonic polyps, they get colon cancer. So that's another syndrome, derm related syndrome where you can get, a, uh, get these fibromatoses. So this is what one of these lesions looked like. So just remember uh, these lesions are common on the hand. Uh, they can occur usually over the fingers, they can occur on the palms and soles, really don't, they don't have to be excised, um, but basically they're in the same family of these fibromatoses. So basically just understand it. There's a couple other soft tissue tumors that are in the differential diagnosis. It's plexiform fibrocystic tumor, calcified aponeurotic, fib aponeurotic fibromas in the differential diagnosis. You don't really need to know a lot about those, but just understand that these are some other sort of soft tissue lesions that can occur in that area. Okay, another lesion taken by a nucleation technique. So again, notice there's no skin here. We're looking only at subcutaneous, looks like era lesion here with fat and, and notice there's lots of fat here, but as we go to higher magnification, there's some other features of this. And we got all these blood vessels here. So anybody know what the diagnosis is here? Hopefully you do. Yeah, good. this is like an example of an angiolipoma. And uh, sometimes you can get just a relatively few of the blood vessels. So maybe you'll see like what looks like an obvious lipoma and looks like maybe this part down here where you just have maybe, you know, it looks like mostly lipoma with a few of these. In other cases, you can get the majority of the lesion to be comprised of the vascular component. Like you look at the top part up here, it's almost all vessel with very little fat. So, and these blood vessels tend to look like this. They could be in this almost kind of tufted type morphology with usually erythrocytes in their lumen. Um, they don't have a very prominent endothelial cells, maybe a few that are slightly prominent. Uh, there's no atypicality here. So you never would really concern yourself with um, an angiosarcoma. And I don't know that these really are truly microthrombi you know, they, they sort of more like sludge red cells, but you very commonly do get blood, you know, red cells here, as opposed to, you know, certain other conditions where you don't. These might be a little microthrombi over here. So if you want to see those, that's, that's, these probably are. These are just, just red blood cells in here. So these are very common to see this. This is in the differential of the painful tumor. And a lot of times we get these submitted to us and they are not uh, submitted with any kind of, uh, uh, pain. So uh, a lot of times they, they just come in as lipoma. So uh, again, this was an angiolipoma. So just make sure that you know uh, what these look like and uh, the differential diagnosis can include some other vascular lesions, but probably never this really. That's like a large, very cellular lesion with some bizarre atypical appearing cells within it. 
Okay, the last one we're going to do here, a little superficial shave biopsy. And, you know, again, we don't like shaves and inflammatory diseases, but this might have actually been taken in a baby. So we'll maybe give them a little bit of credit because anytime, you know, there's a baby that's biopsy, well, nobody likes to do, uh, you know, a punch biopsy. It's possible this could have been a localized papular lesion that they thought was a cancer. So that might have been why they did shave biopsy. The key to this lesion is again looking at the epidermis and what's the reaction pattern that we're seeing here. So this is important to recognize. So this is board 100% you're going to get this on the board somewhere. You might even get some second order questions about what causes the reaction pattern uh, from a, you know, basically a uh, genetic reason. So you're going to have to know that too. But we've got this epidermal hyperplasia that's got a little bit verrucous here. We've got this clear cytoplasm. We've got some hypergranulosis here. We've got a lot of hyperkeratosis. And the cells look like they're falling apart. And here you've got this almost looks kind of like it's recapitulating the tricholimal type of cornification of a hair follicle. Nice example of follicle here to compare that with. So hopefully you guys know what this reaction pattern is. This almost looks like trichohyaline granules. Good. This is epidermal hyperkeratosis. So we've got a follicle over here to compare with it here. So you have to know this. You've got to know the keratin gene mutations. You've got to know all the diseases where you can see epidermal hyperkeratosis. So in this case, it might have been just a solitary keratosis, but it could have been from a baby that had a widespread eruption that maybe looked like this. Probably when you're a baby and you have this, it gives more blisters. So this is, remember, bullous congenital ichthyosis from erythroderma when it occurs in a kid as the epidermal hyperkeratosis actually forms blisters. So that's one of the other ways you can get an intraepidermal vesiculation other than in spongiosis and acantholysis and acanthalytic dyskeratosis. You can get it um, with this phenomenon also. And know that this can occur, again, as a reaction pattern in a number of different settings. So remember here, the ichthyosis linearis hystrix, that also gives you epidermal hyperkeratosis, but it's more of a systematized uh, epidermal nevus. Uh, you can also see it as a solitary keratosis. You can see it as disseminated solitary epidermolytic keratoses. You can see it in uh, some forms of uh, unithose type uh, palmoplantar keratoderma. You biopsy that, it's associated with underlying cancers can sometimes show you epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. So again, just remember that all the settings where you can see epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, it's not um, seen just in one situation. So once again, it's the concept of reaction pattern, it can be seen coincidental or it can be seen in association with genodermatoses. So clinically, blistering diseases, histologically, think of other things that can give you the epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. So that is our session for today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you're looking at these as unknown sessions, because these are posted earlier than we talk about them, I strongly encourage you to quiz yourself, uh, put down the answer, commit yourself, and then we'll go over them here. And uh, normally I'd be calling on you and making you sweat, but uh, since we're not able to do that in a virtual setting, or at least it's not as easy to do in a virtual setting, we're going to do it this way for a while until we get back in front of a microscope. So I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, we will see you again. I think we're going to do this again in a couple of weeks. We'll see you for the general didactic session on Wednesday. And uh, have a great weekend. Take care.